I think there's a lot of us guys, I can speak for myself. I really thought that I wouldn't have to do the work on me if I found this other half, right? Who somebody could complete me or in, in, again, in church language, or help me. All these messages that are given to men that you don't have to work on yourself. You just have to find somebody else who will help you carry you, right? But like, who's carrying the wife? Who's carrying the spouse? That's not talked about in our circles. So as, as the young men are getting messages about how to center ourselves, the women are also getting messages about how to make themselves smaller, which we are not even fully privy to. And you put that together and it's a really bad combination. Welcome. So today I'm talking to Joshua and Jamie Fisher, who, as usual, I found on TikTok. And the reason why I really wanted to talk to you guys is because I've never seen a man unpack themselves so well. Mm. Mm. I love what you say about yourself. I love how you are deconstructing your programming, your conditioning, your history, taking full accountability for the mistakes you've made because you didn't know any better and really creating a connection with your wife and creating a stronger bond out of necessity, but also out of desire. And I wanted to bring you guys into this conversation and really kind of bring you into my world and bring you into my listeners, because I talk about dating and relationships. I talk about choosing the right person and being the right person. And you guys have such a rich history. And I really wanted to bring it forward and have a discussion with you. And I'm so super grateful that you came here today. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to also invite you to think about any questions that you might have for me, because in the course of us doing this, I welcome to open the door for you to learn as much from me as we are all going to learn from you. That sounds, that good. sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> so let me start with an introduction about really what I understand about you guys. You married young and part of marrying young was because of religion. Yeah. And then you came into this relationship with a lot of patriarchy. Yeah, and definitely. Fair, fair summary. Yeah. The, we had the idea that we had to have very certain roles. It was like, well, strong in my mind, I think strong in his yeah. as well. And strong in the circle around us, I think. Yeah. 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 And because of the roles that you felt you were expected to do, there was a lot of ignorance that took place. Mm. Joshua was not seeing all of the labor that was put on Jamie to be a wife and a mother and a homekeeper. And there's a lot of programming that we have in our culture and our society that leads to a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes lead to a huge decline in mental health and emotional well-being. Mm. And I speak a lot about a dating methodology where we use a no kissing for three months dating rule, which is no kissing, no sex, no sleepovers, no exclusivity for a minimum three months so that you're using observation before selection and avoiding making the mistake of picking the person who isn't aligned with your goals and values. Mm. And then in a relationship, we want to have a zero fight relationship. We don't want to make the mistake of blaming other people for our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors when actually we hold responsibility for that. Yeah. And so the mistakes that Joshua talks a lot about doing in the relationship is the mistake of thinking that your role is to go out and get the money and that's it. And it pretty much kind of stops at the door to the house. When you come home, Jamie does all the work. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think there's this... Uh gendered spheres of uh, inequality kind of concept that like a lot of us buy into as a default. And I think that the um, difficulty for me was I, I didn't necessarily believe that entirely. Mm -hmm. I just was looking in the wrong direction. I was comparing myself to the standard of men and then thinking, oh, I'm doing better than that, rather than looking at Jamie and trying to figure out if I was being a good partner to her. So I, I think that I could see lots of ways in which yeah, I definitely believe my role was to go out of the house and make the money. I didn't necessarily believe my role stopped at home. Mm -hmm. I just didn't see, as you mentioned, I think very eloquently, the full extent of that mental labor. And especially once we had kids, that, that became exponentially true, I think. And he was like, in a lot of ways, what a lot of people would consider to be a good dad. Like he came home and he wanted to play with our kids and our kids were little. It was very classic, like yeah. sitcom, like daddy's home. Yay. And the kids would run out to the car and go see him. And he always embraced them. Like I know a lot of people 
I don't know. So he was yeah. always a really good dad and considered like being with the kids something he should do, which is so funny. That's like considered above and beyond for a man <laughs> right? in some yeah. circles. Still a very low bar. So I, I looked at that and thought, well, I, I saw some things work in my childhood or at least or in the men and the families I saw growing up and thought like, well, that's just the way it is. And look at me, I'm trying to improve on those things and I'm doing it. <laughs> what more could there be? And looking like I said, just not paying attention to the person that I had promised to pay attention to. And again, as you had kind of hinted, some of that was, well, all of it, I'll take responsibility for, but a lot of it was a lack of practice in relationship. I did not have a lot of relationship skills. So the intention was there from my standpoint, but the work wasn't. And I think that's one of those things I had to kind of come to reconciling and, and still I'm working on. And this was fostering a lot of resentment in Jamie. Yeah, it, it, it took the form more of bewilderment, yeah. <laughs> I guess, at first. Confusion at first. Um, yeah. I was raised by a single parent who, like, very ardently, like, kind of went to bat for men. It's so funny. I think there's this idea of single moms as being like man hating my mom wasn't my mom's like when you find a good man a good partner in life will lift you up a good supporter will be wonderful to life it will add to your life she really like pumped up this idea partly because she was raising us in christianity where the idea was you're going to get married in a straight relationship and have babies and do all this so she was like nurturing that narrative and but so i was like okay great i'll find a good partner i'll find a really high quality human being. And in a lot of ways, Josh is that for sure. Without a doubt, one of the best I've ever met. But then when we got to marriage and our roles, I just could not believe the way in which I, I now recognized so many women in my life. I kind of had known growing up, women were burdened and tired and sometimes even like sad and lonely, but I was now feeling that wholeheartedly and really feeling it. I think also, to, I love what you said about accountability earlier. Like my role in this, like full accountability was I really also should not have been married. Like I lacked some really essential communication skills that made me a really poor partner. And yeah, did not know how to talk with you in a way that you could hear. I don't know. Yeah, we came from such different family cultural values. I think that the bridge was so far, we didn't even know how to span it sometimes. Uh, in terms of yeah. how, how to hear each other or, or and, and most of this is me. I, I think that in a cultural standard where there are patriarchal values, I went in like many people with privilege thinking, oh, I see you as equal, but not seeing all the ways practically that things had not been set up equally. And so th there was more work, more distance on my end to come to you. You were doing that labor constantly, trying to understand me, trying to support me. And I wasn't reciprocating it, to be honest. Yeah, that's true. So I was mostly just like stunned and like, eventually trying to figure out that we didn't like our kids our oldest about to be 17 what 15 years ago when our kids were little 15 12 13 years ago there wasn't this word emotional labor yeah. this wasn't like the mental load of motherhood wasn't something that was talked about equal partnership fair yeah, play so all those things weren't being talked about although I had the ideas in my mind mm -hmm. I knew I'm like I am doing so much and I'm I am just exhausted and yet he's not it's so funny like he's a good man. He makes a good income. He goes to work. He's, he's reliable. A lot of things that good men are supposed to be. And he was those things, but there was just some key moments for sure, where we really could have had higher quality conversations that allowed us to support our kids better, support each other better. And you mentioned values. I think that's something we talk a lot about now, and I'm sure you have other questions, other insights we could kind of uh, discuss, but I think that like the uh, presupposition from fundamentalist Christianity that not only will you get married, but you will get married young if you find somebody who's a decent person because of purity culture concepts that you're not going to have sex at all until marriage. Which we didn't. Really mm -hmm. set us up, I think, for, it was going to be a difficult time, right? Like we just didn't have the necessary relationship skills. I think we both found a good person. And in the world we came from, it was like, well, I guess that's good enough, right? Like, and I really wanted this relationship, but I don't think that you ever even had a chance to decide if you wanted to be married at all, it was just, well, I'm going to have to say yes to somebody. This seems like yeah. a good enough suitor, I suppose. I don't know. But... In our small circle, there's just a lot of pressure. It's very, it's, I don't know, very weird. I think a lot of, we weren't Mormon, but a lot of Mormon people relate to us because it's kind of very adjacent yeah, very in terms true. of how strict right. nar narratives are pushed. <laughs> Overemphasizing faith as a value rather than practicalities. That was the origins. one value. They're like, the only thing you have to have in common as a couple is God. Like mm -hmm. God is the thing. And looking back now, I'm like, whew, there's so many other values that are so important to people as human beings that really need to be discussed. Like, 
how you'll move through the world and what that would look like. And we, those things went very under discussed mm -hmm. because the idea of God was the thing that was like, well, don't worry, no matter what happens, you've got God in common, which is quite so superficial. And really it, it sort of creates a barrier to some real discussions. Oh, this idea that a cosmic being will just take care of everything all the time um, is a form of like emotional neglect. Mm -hmm. It leaves you without a lot of important conversations right. and without language to have those sometimes or even the cosmic being is prioritizing the institution of marriage above you as a person right? yeah like i said this before the idea that marriage is forever i think sets us up to think that it's never for today and so i just thought i'd have time like even if we had difficulty we have forever to figure it out and that's not fair that wasn't fair to you and i don't think it's a good rubric for a relationship I, I mean, it kind of takes some agency away from you because isn't the saying it's in God's hands. Right. And, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. and so we're not taught that we are actually responsible for our own outcomes. And you guys mentioned how your religion says there's certain things you don't do before marriage, sex before marriage, for example. And when people ask me, what do you think about sex before marriage? I say, do you see this closed box? What you're asking me to do is give you the ultimate commitment. And if you gave it a monetary amount to the ultimate commitment, because it's, for example, it's expensive to get out of a divorce. Mm -hmm. If you gave a monetary amount to marriage, what the value is to you, whether you, without overthinking it, gave it the value of a million dollars or $10 million or a billion dollars, you're asking me to buy this box and I can't open it till I give you the money and mm -hmm. I give you the money. And I open it yeah. and find out I don't, nothing in there. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't yeah. get my money back. That's mm -hmm. insane. Yeah. What did you Ooh. think about that? What was it like opening the box after you paid that price? Oh, that's that's a question for Jamie. I think it's a very in patriarchal cultures. I think it's a very different experience, right? Like, I mean, you knew about the box far before I did. I, I think I was excited about what was in my box. <laughs> <laughs> but not the other way around. Well, well, can I just say your box is easier to get off? Yeah, no, for sure. There's many reasons why it was more exciting to open. Yeah. Well, so we had this rubric, no sex until marriage. And like literally a couple of weeks before marriage, I was getting really anxious about sex and sexuality because I don't do well under pressure. I'm like melts like a popsicle on asphalt. It would be my like rather than works well under pressure. And so I was like, I'm not going to be a great, this will not be good if like, I don't go from zero to 100. I need to find momentum. Like I will need to experience, I will need to warm up to this. Like, and so this idea that we will have gone from like, you were allowed to hold hands and kiss, but like nothing else. In fact, in our religion, you were encouraged not to even talk about sex, which is so damaging. To I mean, for sex to be such a natural part of the human experience, to tell people not to talk about it or think about it is so perverse and creates a lot of perversions. Yeah, because people need to be able to express this part of their bodies and mm -hmm. their minds and their hearts and their spirits. So I was kind of asking him like, oh, can we kind of, can I ask you some questions about your body? Can I know how you feel? Like, I really want, I don't know anything about you. Like I was a 21 year old girl, I, I hadn't even seen a single minute of porn. Like I had seen nothing. Like I had literally no idea other than a sex talk and like some health classes. Like I didn't know. And, and, but this made him really uncomfortable because he thought we were sinning against God. Well, I think it, it was actually exacerbated by the fact that we had gotten, we were like only two weeks from our wedding date. Literally, we were about to get <laughs> so married. Like, no, it wasn't is... like I was like, hey, I, I don't even know if I want to <laughs> no. commit to you. Let's just fool around. I was like, no, we're yeah. literally about to be married. Like, I want to know more. But I had this artificial finish line as like, oh, this is in order to be, I, you know, the, the term in church is pleasing to God, but really it's like, how do I belong? I think that's a human a question. We all want to belong. And so if you're put into a rubric or a, in a world where it says you don't belong unless you obey, the rules become very important. So for me, it was the exact inverse. It's like, oh, we are so close to achieving the goal of belonging <laughs> and following the rules. Why would we even open that box now? But I think we actually had a conversation, you, you brought it up, I think it was looking at indigenous cultures at one point in time mm -hmm. and, and the natural way in which sexuality progressed as intimacy progressed in, in many cultures. And I remember you brought that up to me the first time I thought, like, oh, that doesn't match my worldview or upbringing at all. I have a really hard time with that. And now all these years later, I'm like, of course, that's how that should go. <laughs> like, I, I, like as course. emotional intimacy increases, like physical intimacy can also increase. Yes. Like, but th one shouldn't really outpace the other right. in a, in a long-term healthy relationship. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. like you said, to thwart that or to push it down or to stuff it down artificially, it, it doesn't help. It certainly didn't help us. It set us up for a really 
uh, negative foundation even going into the marriage where there was a lot of frustration, a lot of miscommunication, and a lot of just hurt uh, about not knowing how to communicate or move forward, which then I think I didn't have the emotional skills to really handle or sit with. I did what I had been trained to do in my very brief 21 years of life, which is you suck it up and you just move forward and you just kind of push through. And this is just life. Life is uncomfortable and hard. And but eventually, like, we'll all get on the same page. And, and I mean, what's not sexy about that? So <laughs> Now, I just want to point out, because this is so interesting how you're talking, because it's so reflective of also what I've learned from you on TikTok, which is that Jamie is the more logical one and Joshua is the more emotional person in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. to some extent. Yeah, yeah we, we probably, yeah, to some extent, yeah. What was it that you you taught Joshua that you learned from Indigenous cultures about sexuality? Well, it was a time where, this is so Christian of us, but we had <laughs> four kids and then I was like, sex is horrible. How can we fix it? But we, we'd already had four kids by then. So clearly we were having sex. Can I ask if this is it probing too deeply, if you're open to this, how was it horrible? Why would you define it as horrible? Oh, oh it was. Yeah. So to give some backstory as well, one of the ways I was raised in Christianity and like a lot of the women would literally come up to you as a young bride, a person about to get married. And they're like, look, this is going to be terrible, but it's just something you have to do for your husband. This is, you're going to have to give this to him because he needs it, even if you hate it, which was, well, I look back now and I just realized how many, how many women just confessed to me that they hated sleeping with their husband. And also how many dudes I looked up to my whole life who were just terrible at sex. And like, so, like, anyway, so many people and, and the prevailing narrative, you even heard this in like Bible classes or Bible studies that like men need this. And I actually, the funny part was my family was like a first generation Christian. We didn't have... So my mom kind of like behind closed doors, but like, don't listen to that. Everybody likes sex. Like my mom would like kind of guide me and talk to me about sex in a more real way. And she was like, make sure like, that's something people, but no, like make sure everyone loves it. Like that's not, so I had this idea of like, forget this, what I'm hearing at church. Like, I know I'm horny. Like, I know I want to have sex. Like I've thought about loving it, but some of our miscommunications. So we had that, like before we got married, I was eager to like, just explore a little bit and have conversations and he shut it down, which I perceived as him not wanting to understand pleasure or my pleasure at all. And I got real nervous and wasn't sure what to do about it. But I thought everyone in Christianity would tell you like, don't worry. Once you get married, everything will be fine. Which I think is like, I look back and I'm just like, no other what, are, what is wrong with people? That is terrible advice. <laughs> that is terrible. I was like, okay. And then once we're married, he'll feel more comfortable talking about it. But there's this also this really big buildup that you waited. Now you can do it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but there's a, a condition that has to do with female genitalia called vaginismus which is like actually like a muscular disorder, but it occurs at three times the rate in evangelical women than it does in the normal population. And I really do believe in particular women are told over and over that your body is a stumbling block, that you need to be modest, that you need to be in control. Guys might want to go too far with you, but you make sure he stays behaved. It's like your job to control not only your own sexuality, but like a man's across from you. And you're literally told that. And I really think evangelical women internalize this and it begins to affect their bodies. I would truly believe this was like a mind body connection. So long, like this is, I'm getting, making this really long, but sex really became something that went wildly unexplored. Mm -hmm. We just sort of started to try to stumble through the mechanics of it, but it ended up being terrible because we weren't talking about it. We didn't have any language for it. We were Mm -hmm. told never to talk about it before. Mm -hmm. And then I just wanted to be a good wife. Like my mom had been divorced and in church divorce is such a sin. It's so shameful. Don't let that happen to you. So I was like, okay, well, this is kind of terrible, but I guess I'll just do it here and there. And if he wants to, and I'll try, maybe if I just practice more, it'll get better. But it really very, it felt much like, I don't know if this is too much to say, but like in a squashed adolescent sexuality of your upbringing, Young men are told, don't talk about it, don't think about it, which is like, yeah, what teenage boy is not going to do that? And also, maybe for either of you, don't touch yourself, don't understand your own body. Well, I think I I would say growing up, it was like, you still have that exploration 
Like that there's shame attached to it though, right? So exploring your own body is not encouraged, number one. But number two, it starts to become in that darkness of isolation, a thing that is strictly about comfort and not always in healthy ways. So I think that when you kind of shut down, because I didn't really know how to open you up and our communication wasn't stellar. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what I saw was you coming with that, I don't know, intrinsic, it's so gross. They call it like a wifely duty. I thought that is not what I was hoping for, but I've also been told that I am to be centered in this sexual experience for my worldview. And while I was hoping for like a really robust kind of intimate sexual relationship, Fun, yeah. I don't know how to accomplish that. And if she's still willing to show up, I still feel loved by that. So there's a piece of this that like, it's not what I, we were hoping for, but like, I hope we'll figure it out later. In the meantime, I don't even have agency or autonomy over my own life. So I guess I'll just keep showing up this way. And we would make little bids for connection or improvement. It just had started off on such a poor footing that was hard to overcome. And I think the major thing was at that point in time, I, I doubled down, maybe subconsciously, maybe purposefully on like, okay, I guess sex is for my comfort. And so if you are running, and, and I was constantly picking things, I think out of my own martyrdom, also kind of influenced by my faith, that were very difficult for me. So I, you know, I was going down the path of becoming a social worker, which is really honorable work and probably not a job for me personally. <laughs> but, as but an I, extreme introvert. As an extreme, but I sub, had subscribed to this faith idea that like if you were going to be a good Christian, then you had to be picking up your literal cross daily. Like you had to feel like you were dying. And I had missed the message entirely from faith that perhaps it was about having a life abundant, right? So I was coming into this, like choosing really hard things and then thinking, well, I'm choosing really hard things, what makes this all worth it? Where's the reward? Oh, my person. And not, it wasn't my, I actually, my person probably is a good way to categorize that because it was very possessive. I think it was just like this patriarchal connotation again of like, oh, I have earned a right to access here. And I will never say that out loud. I'm not going to enforce that, but certainly I will act and show up entitled to make sure that I'm getting my needs met. And because you are sad and I don't have the relational ability to communicate that or figure out how where you're at, I, I guess I'll just keep going down this pathway and then maybe it'll get better magically. But it did not get better magically. And so much of that harm was me escaping to sex rather than being present for it, if that makes sense. Yeah, he would just, I, I wouldn't say he had sex. I would say he masturbated with my body. I think that's a fair summary. Like yeah. that's, and I started to use that language toward him. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have sex, you just masturbate with my body. Which I didn't understand like, at all. It, I could be a blow up doll. I yeah, could be yeah. dead. That hurt, like, that hurt my feelings like, so badly. I'm just there. Like but, you don't actually care yeah. about the person. Like he's like, well, I do care, but it, and I think he did to the extent that he knew how, but once again, he lived at a high level of stress and anxiety would continue to choose things in life that made him even more stressed out and anxious. And the one thing in life that made him feel better was sex. Right. So he would want to do that. It was like his one coping mechanism. Like I'll have sex. It'll make me feel better. Not, it'll make me community, not it'll friendships, make, <laughs> not exercise, yeah, not, not eating yeah. well, not yeah. meditating, mm -hmm. not have, like no, no other part. He had no other coping skills. But in that emotional immaturity is key though. I, 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 and so when you would say, or bring any aspect of your experience about how poorly it was going for you, I could not hear that and sit in the discomfort of supporting you, I would always recenter my own experience of like, that's not what I'm trying to do. Like, please hear me that like, I, I am not trying to harm you. I want this to go better. I don't know how, which are valid feelings and emotions, but not valid in that moment. <laughs> in the moment, I should have been present to like, okay, like if this is not working for you, we will find a way, but I just need to shut up for a little second and hear what it's like for you. And I would shut that down so frequently and emphatically that oftentimes you didn't feel like you could even tell me like how your real experiences were, which I think set us up for many other unnecessary yeah. failures down the road. Yeah. I mean, I thought, oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead, my love. I said earlier that I didn't, I lacked a lot of communication skills, which is partly true and partly not. Like I had a lot of, I had a really beautiful inter-family relationship. I have the type of family that has like, we may not talk for months, but then we pick up the phone and we're right into like existential life or death, political, like no topic is uncomfortable in my family. Like it's just, everything's on the table. I'm doing great. I'm doing terrible. Here's the nitty gritty, even mistakes. Like we're pretty aware of each other's mistakes. There's like an acceptance of certain levels of failure and also an, an idea that like, yeah, that was stupid. And you also love and belong. Yeah, like you can, right. we can on the one hand be like, oh, two things you were but I had never been with a person who claimed to love me and then also didn't listen. Right. Like I had no, I did not have the imagination for that. Anyway, so I, and I say I didn't know how to communicate. What I mean was what happened, I ended up just getting really mean. 
like I had to raise my voice. I had to yell. I had to be incredibly like assertive and aggressive, which also made me very upset because I was like, I'd never been in a relationship with someone I claimed to love where I had to get mean just to be heard. And I think that's when I really started to shut down. I was like, this isn't a relationship for me anymore. This is a person I have an obligation to at the moment. But when I, the kids are a little older and I've got my financial act together, I'm going to go, I'm going to leave because I don't want to have to fight someone to get them to love me (laughs) or hear me or listen to me. But you had a question and I wanted to make sure. So you were aware that you had sexual needs before you got married. Oh yeah. When did you come to a point where you're like, I should communicate those needs? Probably a pro- so around 30, at least for me. Um, they say women reach their sexual peaks in their 30s. Their 30s. You got married at around 21? Around 21. So this was like nine years later. I was just super horny and I was like, I can't live like this anymore. Like I want to have fun sex. I want to enjoy it. Like I want to be with someone I want to be with. And I, like either we need to get divorced or like, like we need another relationship, but I don't want to like have this terrible sex life. So like I read, she comes first uh, by Emily Nagoski and I just the native, it was actually, I think an indigenous Hawaiian reflection on sexuality. It actually had to do with the idea of LGBTQ people. And like, I think in Maori culture and some indigenous Hawaiian cultures, the idea that you would have both male and female spirits inside of you. And that like, so it kind of encompassed a lot of things in this writing. And I was, believe it or not, I was reading it on a Hawaiian airline flight in the back of a Hawaiian magazine. <laughs> but they, I think so anyway. It, was, it went into depth about the history of how LGBTQ people have been treated in this region of the world and actually kind of revered. And it talked a little bit about sexuality and intimacy and the way that this wasn't something that was shamed until colonization and like Christianity and missionaries brought Christianity and colonization and then said, stop that, you've got to have this sexuality has to fit in these boxes only whereas they had a much more expansive idea of sex and sexuality before colonization Um, and even gender a much more expensive expansive idea of gender um so i hadn't even meant to stumble across that but it happened to be something i was already on a search for not only did i read emily's book but i read a number of other books at that time and some of them are escaping me also started just listening to podcasts and i just knew that what I had done up to that point hadn't been helpful. Like he wasn't listening to me. So I was like, here, read this book. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, here, I, if you won't listen to me, here's an expert. Like, why don't you listen? To this, why don't we both listen to this podcast and we can discuss it. We needed like some way to have something to bring us together. Cause we didn't have communication that worked out very well. And if I could say this, your wisdom on this front was very helpful, but as she would bring me things, I'm like, oh, if it's on the topic of sex, of course, I, I want to get better at this because it's it's not going well. I would like it to, but I will be 100% honest here that my emotional maturity was so stunted that I couldn't get out of my own way. Like e- even when I found out there were ways that you particularly like to be touched or, or ways in which like you enjoyed certain things, I still had this rubric for a long time that like, oh, the outcome is what we're aiming for, right? Like, so in sex, if orgasm for a man is the point I'm trying to get to, then it must be exactly the same for a woman. And I think going back for a, a purity culture standpoint, that this became evident how wrong this was. I think some, so many couples struggle out of fundamental Christianity and then getting married in their sex lives in part because of an artificial barrier, right? Because you cannot have quote unquote sex, a lot of time is spent just kind of like holding hands and intimate touching, or I mean, not intimate touching, but like kind of rubbing your back maybe, or like good conversation. So all the things that maybe some women enjoy about sex most when you really think about sex holistically, and then just not like the intercourse part. And then the band-aid is ripped off in conservative Christianity. It's like, well, now you can have sex, right? And from a man's point of view, the way we were socialized poorly, sex was the intercourse part, not all of the foreplay, for lack of a better term, all of the intimacy that led up to that. And so I think that I got that 100% wrong. So even as I started to try to understand sex better and understand you better, I still was aiming for the wrong thing. Like it was, it was very linear. It, it was yes. very much like we it, haven't had sex if we don't, haven't met the finish line so within it, the next 30 minutes. And, yeah, like, and with kids and other things, it was difficult to find time to unfold. Like I can have things progress naturally. That was a real barrier. But I kept thinking, oh, like it, it, it doesn't count unless. So I, if you have these needs and now you can communicate them, then I will make sure that you get to this artificial finish line that I think 
but that's not how it works. Like, I just didn't get it. And I think there's a lot of men who don't. I don't know. Yeah, so sex, I think real sex is Mm open-ended, spontaneous, mutually pleasurable for both parties. Mm Co-created. Co-created. Like, that would be the foundation of sex. There's no, there is no destination other than being present to the person you're with. And giving and receiving pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that can take a lot of forms. And, but not in his mind, it was like, it was almost like like a horse with blinders on. Like, I'm going toward it. And like, but I can't see all the beautiful, expansive options. I just see this one thing. I think in some ways, even though it was starting to get better it was worse <laughs> like, like like i had more information but i was using it poorly and i, I just think that there's waves of just the lack of communication and the lack of true health and the lack of community around this it's such a taboo topic that people are not sharing the information that would be very helpful i, I think of myself as a good willed person not that i've always had good impact i certainly have not like but i want to believe i really want to believe that if somebody had taken me aside before we getting married uh, even in that conservative world and explained a few of these things that I would have done much better. Like there just was nobody telling me anything that was helpful. And then nobody helping me kind of hone the skills that were most important, which was how would I talk to the person that I love about our relationship? So it just, I mean, you must have been, let's give you at a level 100 score of like ability and emotional capacity and sensuality. And I, would, I was somewhere in the negatives. Like I wasn't even on the same page, not even in the same book. So how do you bridge that? You and know? this is really interesting, Sean. Do you say Chantel or Chantel? I want to make sure I get it right. Any way you want to say it, because okay. like different people will say it in different ways. And for me, it's all lyrical. So okay. 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 One thing I would love to discuss or just mention, because it's, in mainstream ideas, it's so switched. So I came into our marriage having, I had previously had an eating disorder, but did all this therapeutic work around my body and developed this deeply loving whole relationship to my body. And even as a young person to my sexual, my solo sexuality, Mm -hmm. I loved using my body. I loved being in my body. I was comfortable in my body. Like I had done all this work to really be at home in my body, which is so funny because he came to our loving relationship with a lot of body issues and a lot of Mm -hmm. discomfort with his body, a lot of shame about his body, which is so funny because I think there's in so many narratives, we say like, oh, women struggle with body image. Well, men can struggle with it too. And it can be just as damaging, but we don't talk about that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that was a barrier in our sex life is- yeah, not so much discomfort with you, just discomfort with myself. I, I, I think that's something I've kind of constantly had to come to grips with. It was like, oh, I, I, I kept promising you things like I can love you well, but if you can't love yourself well, you don't, <laughs> you're given from the empty well, from the empty box, right? There's just not a lot there. So the, the work has to be done in reverse. I think there's a lot of us guys, I can speak for myself. I really thought that I wouldn't have to do the work on me if I found this other half, right? Who is somebody who could complete me or in, and again, in church language, or help me. All these messages that are given to men that you don't have to work on yourself. You just have to find somebody else who will help you carry you, right? But like, who's carrying the wife? Who's carrying the spouse? That's not talked about in our circles. So as, as the young men are getting messages about how to center ourselves, the women are also getting messages about how to make themselves smaller, which we are not even fully privy to. And you put that together and it's a really bad combination. I do. Yeah. Out of curiosity, how long was your courtship for before you guys got married? Oh, you're about two years. We started, this is so crazy. We started dating when we were 19 mm-hmm. and we got married when we were 21. Yeah. So, we were um, children. We didn't live together before marriage either. No, we did not live together. No. Oh, no, we didn't. No, that would have been a big no. Well, and on top of that, we also like dated and met in kind of a college environment, like where you're living on camp. So it's not even a, it's, a, it's an artificial environment in every sense of the, the term, right? Like, like meals are made for you. Like you're going to school, but not, we had like part-time jobs, but like, it's not a real practice environment. So we, I mean, Jamie is an amazing, like an amazing cook, like just like a real love for food, like a huge value in her life. I had come from a household that was scarcity mindset about pretty much everything but food inclusive like I didn't have any skills to bring to that but we did not even know what each other brought to the table on that when we got married so I was like again opening my box like holy cow this is amazing like look at this like five-star chef who's making these beautiful things and has this really great food aesthetic like I I have none of that sorry one one time (laughs) the second week you're married I was like hey I just put a cake in the oven I'm like I have to take a shower can you just pull it out when the Timer goes off. He's like, I don't know how, how? to open an I oven. I want to get burnt. Like, how? I've never opened an oven before. <laughs> and I was like, such like a cat, like a like, grand canyon oh, no. apart from the things that would have helped us be successful. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Did mm-hmm. you, do you still practice Christianity? 
Mm, I think I think we take te- some tenets of faith. I think yeah. Jesus is a very admirable person, but not yeah. we don't hold it in the same way that we held it as in our younger years. I think to the extent that we practice it, it is in the form of making sure um, those with the least can be lifted up. A, a sense of social justice, a sense of making sure the least of these um, have love and belonging, a sense that everyone can be redeemed. I think maybe those are the, we we carry some very specific tenets. Yeah, um, I'd say I still haven't seen anybody explain a better way to live life than Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. We still try to live by that. We still have like church community. It's not the same pedestal or priority that used to be in terms of following the rules, but it still plays a major influence in our life. I, I think like many people who take their faith, and this might be controversial, but I think we take your faith very seriously. It, it You have to kind of go through adversity to figure out what you actually believe mm-hmm. and is it actually working not just what the community of people in your bubble tell you. And so I think there are really deep levels of faith that I think we both still hold. Uh, and I, I think there might be broader than just Christianity on, on some sense. Right? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would subscribe to the fundamentalist version of Christianity at all, or that version of God that I had in my head, but I do believe in a God. And I no longer think it's like the only way. Right. I think it's a very good way. It can be a good way. It can also be a terrible way, uh, depending <laughs> on how you wield it. Mm-hmm. Personally, I'm, I'm opposed to anything that says it controls other people's bodies, whatever mm. that would be. And so religions, a lot of religions, they have that bodily control over other people. And I, I speak out vehemently against that. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to Christianity, I zero in on the Jesus part and I'm like, follow Jesus, because the word of Jesus is what we all should be doing but if you look at all the other parts i'm like toss that in the garbage that's that's what we've done (laughs) like Like we want to we make sure kids in foster care have what they need and we look at the people our community is there someone with needs and they need to be lifted up right now do they need money do they need meals like we just want to make sure we're always and saying things like humility things like a community like those are the values of jesus that we like hold dear to but yeah I, i like what you said I love that word humility, because for me, it actually was a turning point in my own evolution and my relationship with my husband. I've been with my husband for 18 years, and we did 10 years of fighting. And I remember when we teach what we most need to learn. And there was a time when I was a the person on the other line of the crisis helpline because I was suicidal and Mm -hmm. so I I learned to be the person who could support others in an attempt to really learn to support myself and one of the callers was a male who really kind of went on a rant about how women need to be more humble and I know me saying this would create a lot of defensiveness in people but for me it was a chord that needed to be struck because a lot of the dysfunction in my relationship was because of me and it was because I was in my ego and so I was having uncomfortable emotions about things and instead of taking accountability for my own thoughts emotions and behaviors I was blaming my husband for how I felt instead of looking at my own insecurities and mental dysfunctions and so when he said that at that moment you know how like the universe God whatever will deliver what you need when you need it and so here's this gentleman on the other end of the line saying women need to be more humble and that voice I call it the capital T the capital V voice in my head that guides me that knows better than me that is smarter than me but that voice said listen to this, pay attention to this. This is a message for you. And I, I really did take it to heart. And I approached my relationship with more humility. I approached my relationship taking more accountability for my own emotions, my own thoughts, and the behaviors that I was exhibiting. I do.